The highways of social and commercial developments are widening without end or limit. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Decrypting Crypto Podcast, a Castbox original show. I'm Matthew House Barbie, and I'm joined by my co-host, Austin Knight. Hey Matt, and hello to everyone listening. Yeah, we got a really, really interesting guest on the show today, haven't we, Austin? Yeah, so we're going to be talking with Gleb Nikitin, the co-founder of MetaHash. Yeah, and Gleb's project, MetaHash, has caught both me and Austin's eye over the past couple of weeks because there were a few interesting and pretty big claims behind the project. And we know that Gleb is a very technical guy. Uh, he can dig into the into the weeds of all of the tech behind not only the project he's running, MetaHash, but across the wider crypto space. So we wanted to get his thoughts around some, some different things within crypto mining, in particular, one thing that he's calling forging within the proof of stake consensus algorithm that they actually use at MetaHash. And another big thing that we're going to dig into is hearing his thoughts around the current and future state of decentralized applications, or as they're commonly known, dApps. And this is where we want to figure out when are we going to actually be at a place with dApps where they're commonly used by the general public, and when we may see big companies like Facebook and Snapchat and Co. taking a foray into this space. Yeah, Gleb has some really interesting thoughts on this. Some big claims backed up with details. So it's an interesting conversation that uh, we got to have here. Yeah. All right. Well, Austin, should we get this thing going? All right. Let's do it. Gleb, welcome to the Decrypting Crypto podcast. Thank you. So let's start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the crypto space. Um. Well, uh, I will start like from the very beginning. I have been like working in internet for my whole life, and I would say like like every cent I have ever, ever earned in my life was in internet. Uh, I started like as a graphic designer and programmer in uh, sixteen, doing some website jobs, etc. That grew up in, in a small company, uh, taking more jobs and taking more people in. Then it was uh, like a series, uh, a series of different projects, and I was like finally very interested in advertising systems and like how all that stuff, all that stuff goes. My last company is called Ed Sniper. It was focused uh, on uh, internet real time bidding. For those who is not very specific about the term, I will take a brief. It looks that way. Like whenever a person comes on, the, on any website, there is a code from some advertising system and they send us the request uh, of if we want to buy this particular impression and how much we are willing to pay. That practically means that we receive the request like from the whole internet, uh, like every second. Wow. And uh, in some regions, like that is close to billion requests, uh, billion requests per second. And so like that's a lot. So like we re receive requests from like all from all websites. We receive that from Google Network, from uh, from Yahoo, like from everybody, from AppNexus. And uh, what we do to this app, like we are working like with big uh, with big agencies, with big network agencies. Uh, then uh, that they use our tech to buy advertising for their clients. But we I'm are, glad. Sorry yeah. to sorry to interject. Just uh just to clarify. Ad Sniper, th that isn't a blockchain-based business, right? This, this is the company that you formed, and it there's no blockchain technology in that company. Am I right? Yes, exactly. Ad Sniper, like it's a purely, purely advertising tech company, but it gives the background for the start of MetaHash. Oh yeah, uh, that's that's why I'm explaining because like working with Ad Sniper, like we did a lot of things that are very similar to what uh, blockchain is all about. It's data synchronization. It's like keeping like millions of requests per second. It's, it's about high load, big data processing, machine learning, etc. Everything that is really needed in blockchain. 
And since we were like uh, a pure tech company, we received a lot of requests from clients if we could use blockchain in their projects, so like to make uh, advertising more transparent. But at first, our answer was always, well, no, they're like too slow and it wouldn't just fit in. Uh, but then we got more and more interested and we were also passionate about the idea of applications uh, that can run all by themselves and be like self-financed. So we have a couple of ideas that we really wanted to implement, but we saw that like the technology stack wasn't there. Like there wasn't every piece of technology that we wanted to create, uh, to create great apps. So we thought it would be best for us to take the knowledge from advertising space and from the tech stack that we'll build throughout these years and use it uh, to build uh, the, the needed technology for the concurrent decentralized ecosystem. So that's how it started. Cool. And that's where you then went on to form MetaHash, yeah. right? Which is now your, your new company. Yeah, exactly. So tell us about MetaHash and what you all do there. Uh, well, the thing is, like, um, everybody usually see us as like uh, just a new fast blockchain. But the idea behind the project is a little bit different. The basic idea is that we wanted to build a decentralized cloud hosting for applications that would function in real time. That means that like when you know, somebody uploads an application to our network, it just pop-ups on a lot of instances. And where comes the blockchain chain itself is that these applications must somehow synchronize the data between between each other. So because like, let's say you have an application that is running in real time and you as a client connect to one of these applications and you save some data there and then you connect to another instance that know nothing about your previous session. And here is exactly when the chain comes in. So we needed to the cloud of decentralized applications. We needed a fast chain uh, that could like transfer data and synchronize data between these instances very fast. And that is the chain part. And of course, like, uh, like if we found a way to synchronize that data very fast, like we wanted microtransactions uh, to be also available to these applications to perform any type of uh, financial, financial transactions between the user and the application and between the application and the hosting. Right. And, and how far, just touching on some of the speed pieces there, how, typically how fast would, a, would an average transaction be on, on MetaHash? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have currently tested our network on 244 servers around the world. We were like just renting different, uh, so di- different servers and different virtual servers from different providers around the world. And then we ran the tests of about 5 billion transactions that were about three months long. And we got two results uh, that uh, were going from 60,000 to 80,000 uh, per second capacity. And like the, the majority of time, the transaction confirmation or the irreversible uh, transaction uh, has appeared in less than three seconds. Oh, wow. Wow. That sounds pretty significantly faster than a lot of the larger networks, right? So why is that? If we look at cryptos like Bitcoin, Ethereum, right? The huge networks with processing a huge volume of transactions, but outside of the Lightning Network, transaction speeds are relatively slow. I know you've got platforms like EOS with faster transaction speeds, but there's some <laughs> there's some debates around how decentralized the likes of EOS are. So why, why is it that that MetaHash is, is so fast? Uh, it's because like we viewed the problem on a completely different angle. And so we were building the network like to synchronize fast. And uh, MetaHash has a pretty complex architecture, but it is really there not to complex things up, but to speed up the transaction, speed up the data synchronization, and to put through the network as much data as possible. Talking back like to Bitcoin and other popular networks, uh, they did a really terrific job on the cryptographical side, on the medical medical side of things, Mm -hmm. like and uh, great concepts in blockchain structure and design were born. And many companies like Cardano are making the great improvements uh, in the cryptographical space 
and uh, making adoption to 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 the chain designs themselves. But like our company, like we had a little bit different skill skill set that we used. Like uh, we are all about high load, about network synchronization, big data processing, and we just added our skills to to the existing blockchain patterns and like mix them together. We didn't do any like uh, significant uh, cryptographical advance because like there is a lot of brilliant team around the world working on this. So we really focused on what we do best and that's network synchronization and data storage. We did implement one thing that like differs us a lot from chain design. Uh, we implemented a new consensus design uh, that we have called uh, multipost. It's like multiple or multiple proof of stake. Oh, okay. It has one feature that stand, uh, stands out from normal uh, from normal chain consensus. Uh, because we did the network design where we can synchronize the network very fast, and we did that in a tree manner. So like when the block is born, it goes like a tree and spreads throughout the network. We thought if we did that, why don't we try uh, to verify if the block is correct or not on each step of the synchronization. That means that while we are synchronizing, we are also validating the block. And uh, by doing this, it means that like that we have a much higher grade, uh, not just to get the first acceptance of the transaction within these three seconds, but we can get very high, highly probable, irreversible transaction within this try time frame. So is the would it be fair to say the, the main takeaway there is that you've really improved the efficiency of achieving consensus and generating new blocks as well as like just generally building in the infrastructure that increases the transaction speed? Is that it, would that be a good takeaway from that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And and just one thing that I am interested just on, because I know actually we wanted to talk a little bit around consensus and some of the things around mining, which I know Austin had some questions for you around. But before we jump into that, around the transaction speed, one thing that is kind of a bit of a a pain point for me that I find is I hear about a lot of projects that will claim very, very fast transaction speeds, but they'll often achieve this when the usage of the network is quite low. And then as soon as network usage goes up and the hash rate increases, then we start to see delays in transaction time. So a classic example would have been Ethereum last year, which when the the CryptoKitties uh, decentralized app started pushing through a bunch of uh, transactions onto the network, Ethereum transaction speeds went crazy slow and people were waiting 45 minutes to an hour, if not even longer than that. So how does MetaHash solve the scaling problem? Is there something that's going to help you maintain that speed of transactions as you have more and more people using the network? Or is that something that you, you're still going to have to come up against as an issue? No, it actually we want like uh, we have uh, ran exactly uh, the test of when the transaction speeds, like the incoming transactions, they exceed the level that like we are counting on. Like in our tests, we have went up to 600,000 transactions per second. Of course, wow. when that much of transaction is flowing in, we don't achieve three seconds uh, for a confirmation. Uh, the network is, go- is getting slower. Uh, we were getting results around 10 or 11 seconds for a confirmation. But like at 600,000 flowing in, uh, like that's a good number. Yeah, for context, how many transactions per second would something like Bitcoin or Ethereum do as a comparison here? Uh, well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't like compare it to Bitcoin and Ethereum because like their numbers are like uh, really low because they are in the process of updating their designs. I would compare it like to fastest chains that now are available. Like the maximum speeds that I've heard about uh, would be the 3,000 mark, uh, the 3,000 per second. In a, uh, in a system that is planned to be fully decentralized. Got it. Wow. So you're like orders of magnitude higher load and you're maintaining those speeds. Uh, yes, something like that. That, of course, like 
makes the design a lot more complex. Uh, like right. uh, we are releasing the yellow paper like pretty soon, I think like in two weeks or so, uh, where we describe like all the experiments that we have done about that and uh, how we achieved that and like where we are and what we still have to do. Because, uh, because the network architecture is very complex and many solutions that we used haven't been yet tried before, we will have to go uh, through a pretty hard process of step-by-step -step decentralization. So like to first decentralize one row, then another, then run tests and tests and tests to see like uh, how everything goes, if everything runs smoothly. So the people that actually use the network right now uh, wouldn't be taking a risk, but uh, I still will kind of like uh, come to an endpoint successfully. Okay. So sort of progressing ahead here, another thing that we wanted to talk about was crypto mining, fairly contentious topic. We discussed this in detail during our first season of the Decrypting Crypto podcast, especially around how it guzzles energy. There are some cool factoids thrown out, cool or, or disgusting, depending on how you view it. Um, <laughs> saying that uh, Bitcoin was consuming more energy per year than the entire nation of Ireland. So crazy things happening there. And you've mentioned in the past that MetaHash uses something called forging, which is apparently an environmentally safe alternative to mining. Can you talk about what this is and how it works in comparison to something like proof of work? Uh, yes, sure. But like um, I have to mention, so, like, uh, I represent like a company that develops proof of stake algorithm. Uh, I must mention like that proof of work also uh, has one very important benefit, and that benefit is called like proven by time. So, as proof of stake uh, systems, including MetaHash, uh, really try to make uh, to make like the process more efficient. Bitcoin is like has has the value because. It has like 10 years of different attacks and manipulation things to going around. So though it does uh, burn a lot of energy and is not so efficient and like is maybe not so fast, it is actually like uh, pretty secure and it is proven by years that it is. Right. Uh, how, uh, yeah. However, I'm completely sure like that the future is about the proof of stake systems or like proof of authority systems or some hybrids where actually the nodes get the payment and like people owning the coins or having the authority tokens have the stakes. Uh, why? Because like the main work of actually transmitting the transactions uh, lies exactly in the nodes and that are servers, uh, that are like the connection speeds, etc. And like if you financially motivate the right nodes, you get the results that you get better hardware at that point. Just for just for some of our listeners here, just to clarify a few bits of terminology there. So you were talking about nodes, and in this respect, this would be someone's kind of mining rig or node is like their computer that they're using specifically for mining. And when you're you're talking about proof of stake, in instead of using processing power like in proof of work, you would be staking the the, the tokens or the coins that, that you've accumulated through the mining process to achieve consensus, right? And I, I actually haven't heard of the, the other piece that you talked about, which was proof of authority. Could you just elaborate a little bit for, for our listeners in what that is? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm sorry, let me, do, let me also start like from the very, very beginning. That'd be great. Proof of work or proof of stake, both networks do have nodes that are responsible for synchronizing all the all the transactions between themselves, uh, the difference between the proof of work and proof of stake is in that that proof of stake usually pay directly to node owners that are responsible for synchronizing transactions, while in proof of work nodes usually uh, don't get any benefits and only the miners the rigs do, uh, and like the miners just keeps uh, keeps the nodes to synchronize the transaction in order to be able to get the reward for mining the block. And in proof of stake, uh, the nodes are directly financed, uh, so better hardware could flow into that end and we can uh, reach a higher amount of nodes. As concerned, like stake or authority, like proof of what, yeah? Pro like proof of stake is uh, like when you 
get some coins or de and deposit them. Proof of authority is when the tokens or coins are given to some people community trust. And there is uh, a number of uh, algorithms there, but it's all about staking. So we have the hardware that is installed somewhere on internet channels that makes the work of synchronizing transactions. But in order to defend the network from attacks, we have to implement some algorithm, some resource uh, that is not so easily obtained. It's a coin stake or a special to uh, tokens that are given to you, uh, community members that people trust that are staked upon these nodes. So that's how proof of stake works. And so where does this, this idea of forging come in? This, this isn't something that I'm familiar with. And I know me and Austin were talking before uh, we, we hopped onto this conversation. And we were, we were wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what that actually means. Sure. Like uh, in uh, the thing is that in MetaHash, there is no single node that practically uh, like forms a block alone. The block is forged by almost all nodes in the network. There is no single uh, validator in MetaHash. So when a block is born, it goes through a series of confirmation by different nodes that confirm that the block is correct. And so like uh, each of them forges the block on and on till it gets to the end coin. Uh, so it's called forging because all the nodes uh, make the block together. Right. How are the block rewards distributed across those those nodes? Does it almost work in a way kind of like a mining pool would? Or uh, The thing is that we record the performance on all nodes in a separate chain. Uh, we call it the technical chain. And we record the stakes that each of the node has. Like we record all the work that was done by all of these nodes and like by all the people that may make stakes and all of the people running metagates on their home computers. And after the 24 hours mark, uh, we calculate all of that and distribute rewards to all network participants. So there's no reward for a single block in MetaHash, though the pool from forging pool and commissions for these 24 hours are distributed between all network participants. I see. Okay, so it sounds to me, if I'm getting this correctly, that the the, the element of forging is almost a, a facet of or a modified version of the the proof of stake consensus Correct. method. Right. Correct. Right. Okay. Wow. That sounds sounds really interesting. And I'm assuming a, a lot of the stuff that we were talking about around this being a more environmentally friendly is because it's not using the crazy processing power of proof of work. Uh, yes, surely, and we have uh, gone one step further. Uh, what we did, like, uh, we implemented minimal stakes for node draws. So uh, the thing is that if there are not enough nodes in the network, you need the less coins. But if we get enough nodes to run the network securely, the minimal uh, stakes come into play so we can limit the amount of nodes actually running the network. So like the top number, uh, the top number goes like in thousands, but it won't be something like a million nodes working to approve the transactions because like the network just doesn't need that much. Mm. So we, we tried to like put a cap on the amount of total nodes in the network that could be active. I see. Just to save up resources and expensive hardware that is really not needed in the network. Because like a big network can use maybe okay ten thousand nodes, but do you really need one million? Like we think that we don't. I see. I see. So one of the last things that me and Austin wanted to touch on was around decentralized apps. We've we've talked a little bit here about some of the different consensus models that MetaHash is using. How you you think about transaction speeds, but one thing you also mentioned is that MetaHash, you can build and manage decentralized apps or dApps on it. And one, one thing I'm quite interested to know outside of the actual dApps themselves, one example that a number of our listeners maybe have heard of is like CryptoKitties and there's many, many more out there. But where, when do you think we're going to be close to the level of adoption from the general public where decentralized apps are just a 
everyday normal part of our life. Do you think that we're close to to that, or do you think we're five, ten years away? How, how far away do you think? Uh, I think like we are about two or three years away. I'll explain why. Like 2018 uh, was the year of companies uh, like MetaHash, like Gelos, like Tron, like many others, like Zilliqa, made a lot of fast blockchains, made a lot of takes on building the network infrastructure to be right for decentralized applications. And I think like 2019 uh, will take developers like to learn these new tools, to understand what suits them best, or even to use a mixture of the tools provided by different networks to build like really awesome applications. And like in 2020, they'll start like the advertising campaigns that would really bring in the masses inside the decentralized applications. And I think like MetaHash uh, made a really important move in that direction by like the, the concept of cloud hosting for decentralized apps that would allow them to work in real time and just synchronize the data through the chain. And I'm sure that like uh, a lot of other companies would make also very interesting moves. And by the end of 2018, we'll already have a solid tech stack to build upon. So when you say two to three years and big companies making moves, do you think of giants like Facebook and Snapchat making a move to decentralized apps? What would be the benefit of them doing something like that? I think that uh, they won't really benefit from that, but in most tech companies right now, uh, the founders are still at play, and uh, I'm absolutely sure some of that some of them are also fascinated by decentralized technology in general, and the ideas and an application can live all by itself. So I, I'm sure that, like in some of the biggest tech companies, at least in experimental laboratories like Google X, some experiments will take place, and like they'll try to also uh, dig into it and try to open some services as decentralized, like uh, you know, trying to get more user trust uh, in the things that the service won't change, uh, because I think that even like these tech giants now understand that while the founders of these tech giants are still running the companies, it's pretty safe because like that, that were the people that were passionate about the, it, that invented these companies. But what happens next when the founders are not at play and like we as humanity are fully dependent on these tech giants uh, that are governed by a uh, board of directors, etc., And uh, that is like, I would say a bit scary. And I think like the founders of these tech giants, they, you know, I, I think they think about it the same way. What will happen when they will stay back? Uh, what will the giants that they have built from scratch do after they step back? Yeah. and. And I guess for some of the big companies in the world, I, I would use Facebook as one example, right? Because we've we've all had uh, near the start of 2018, Mark Zuckerberg talking about his interest in blockchain technology, and there's a lot of speculation around there. But one thing that I kind of wonder here is, it, it seems to me for a big centralized, publicly listed company like Facebook that all of the power is in the data that they own, which they then ultimately use to power their advertising revenue. Why, why would they risk all of that business model by then creating a decentralized application where they would then no longer have control over the data that they could then use for advertising? Do you believe that there's going to be a, a real shift culturally from, and from a business point of view from some of these big companies? Uh, I don't expect them to make any bold moves in like the coming years. Like the bigger the company, the slower it takes the decisions. But I'm sure they will like play with it. I think that the, they will launch some small experimental applications first to see how it uh, how it is going. But if they see like uh, real interest from the people, why not? Because like a decentralized application can actually be very profitable. If uh, it gain, it really gains traction and it gains viral interest from people. So even uh, even after it's like gone out to the world as open source and decentralized, 
application, it can still be profitable as a business. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can definitely, I can definitely see that. We, I mean, we've seen really only on a small scale now, and I, I, I hate to keep using the CryptoKitties example, but it's probably one of the the few decentralized apps that's hit the mainstream to a certain extent. I, I'm interested to see where it goes. What, what do you, what do you believe? Gleb is probably one of the more interesting applications that you could see the everyday person using as a decentralized application. Um, I would say I would say like the, uh, one of the great tribes would be of course Gates. It could be like uh, you could possibly think that like people are just okay like with centralized games, but actually it's not. Like people that are really into some game, they live in that world. And they are very much afraid that the administration of the game will change some rules. Mm. And like uh, their sword of power will just one day vanish. Uh, like they have spent two years like to get that sword and it will just vanish because the administration of the game just has decided so. Uh, and I think that the beginning of decentralized games uh, would bring a major shift where when the players would really believe that everything works exactly as it must and like it won't just change without their notice. And I think like that uh, games would be one of the first like to populate technologies and like CryptoKitties, uh, like a perfect example, like an application that really took uh, use and like could build something interesting uh, upon the slow networks uh, that existed up to today's point. But I see like a lot of other uh, other examples, like it's messaging, it's mm. uh, like everything, it's like sharing of data, it's like storing encrypted data when you are absolutely sure that nobody has access to it because it's, it is just encrypted by your case or it is publicly stored. So I see a lot of applications, uh, we just have to work upon driving the cost of transaction down, driving the cost of data storage down, uh, like improving the speed, improving the experience of the person uh, that is interacting with the decentralized app. Uh, once it gets as easy as interacting with the website, up, that's the point where, where like it will take off. I'm I'm looking forward to when it happens. I, I really am, especially on things like messaging and areas that we're starting to see come more and more into our lives. I think voice assistance is another area there where there's a dangerous amount of centralized data. Probably could talk about this for an entire episode, but <laughs> unfortunately, we're we're coming up to time. But Gleb, I, I just first of all, I, I really want to thank you for coming on the show, sharing some really interesting information and. Just before we before we wrap up, why don't you let our listeners know where and how they can get in touch with you to learn more about the projects you're working on and MetaHash and uh, just generally learn more from you? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, secondly, on the website, there are links to my to my social networks, so they can just follow me there and like follow the project's official channels where we post all information. Uh, there is like uh, not much of me talking about things because like uh, I'm uh, like really busy right now with development of all those things. <laughs> but as we process, uh, I like I wanted to record one video and just put it on the line for a long, long time. But I didn't manage to yet. But I will get to it <laughs> and I will get. Yeah. But as like after after we will publish the yellow paper and like make this going a little bit faster. And I'm confident that development is good stake. Uh, then I'll uh, take more time to like talk to people and like record some videos and put them to all of our channels and to explain what we are really up to. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, we've we've got this podcast episode that at least you've you've managed to push out as well. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me and like listening to you talk about my hash and like explain like what's our vision about it. Yeah, well, all the best, Gleb. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. 
If you love this episode and want to show your appreciation to myself and Matt, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review on the CastBox app or your favorite podcasting platform. We'd really appreciate that. And if you haven't already, you can download the free CastBox app where you'll find us as one of the CastBox original shows. You can also visit thecoinoffering.com to learn more about cryptocurrencies, get caught up on some news, see how your currency is performing, and you can follow us on Twitter at the coin offering. Finally, you can ask us any questions you have by emailing us at podcast at the coin offering.com. The Decrypting Crypto Podcast is a Castbox original show, and its contents should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.